Welcome. It's so awesome to be coming and sharing my story with you all here in Melbourne. My name is Chris Robinson and I work at Aberfoyle Park High School. We're a government school, a state school in South Australia. And at the moment I teach maths and computer science, year 10, year 11, year 12. I worked previously as a website developer before I got my Master of Teaching and became a teacher. So I really enjoy coding and programming and making things and tinkering. And you'll see more of that in a minute. I really enjoy using open source software. All of the apps that I get my students to use are open source and free, whether it's a text editor for editing code or all the software that we use, we use Python a lot. All of it's free and open source and cross-platform. This talk is going to feature a little bit of my story and what my students have done with the amazing Pythonista app. And hopefully it'll inspire you to maybe use Pythonista in your own workflow. It's a really good app and it allows you to create really quick prototypes. You can quickly write some code and run it and it'll just work. I use it for testing out things in using the scene module, which uses SpriteKit, but you can also do stuff with UIKit and so on. At the moment, there are two versions of Python Easter on the App Store, and they are both $15. The one on the left is currently version two, and it's the one that I've been using for a couple of years. Python Easter 3 has just come out, and it uses Python 3 instead of Python 2.7. And yeah, if you're going to go and get it yourself, go and get Python ESA 3. It's awesome. For this story to make sense, first you need to know a little bit of background and how I got started using this app. So as I was introduced, I have a Bachelor of Information Technology and I really wanted to introduce a level of coding into Aberfoyle Park High School. When I first rocked up, no one did any code at all. And I thought it was a little bit surprising seeing as we're the gifted and talented school for the southern region around where I live. So I was currently teaching maths and science because the IT classes were really, really small and there was no full-time job available and I wanted full-time, so I took maths and science. So I decided to start off a lunchtime group meeting yeah, twice a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. And yeah, people would just rock up and learn some code from me. I'd give them some tutorials and give them some challenges and off they went. So yeah, I hadn't done any Python before. The first time I'd learned Python was 2014. And previous to that, I'd done three years of Java during my degree and Fortran and C and Pascal and others. So I started this lunchtime group and it started off really successful and it just kept growing from then. So my school that I work at at the moment is an iPad school. So that means when the students first rock up at year eight, because we start our high school at year eight in SA, when they first rock up, their parents need to purchase an iPad for them so every single student that rocks up in year eight has an iPad. And next year, every single person in the whole school will have an iPad. So it makes sense. If I'm gonna teach them how to program, it would be really good if they could do it on the iPad directly and they wouldn't need to go into a computer lab. They're so used to using their iPads, why can't they do a little bit of code on them? I had a look around in the app store and I found this app called Pythonista and it looked really slick. And I'm like, uh, I don't really know Python. So I had to quickly learn it. And so I learned Python pretty much as I started developing the course. Just a quick uh, hands up, who's, who's used Pythonista before? Do we have any Pythonista users? Yay, that's awesome. Yeah. 
yeah, I wanted them to be able to create their own stuff, so I started the group and I made an iTunes U course. Does everyone here know what an iTunes U course is? That's cool. It was a good way, it's a good way of distributing the content out to them. I'd push out a Wednesday topic and a Friday topic every single week, and then they'd just be able to find it. If they didn't rock up that day, or they had like dance club or break dance or wherever else, whatever else they were doing, they would just look at my notes and they would see the challenges and they'd be able to tackle the problems. Before I talk about the student apps, I'm going to quickly talk about how I'm using Python to, to develop a quick prototype for this. So, is anyone, has anyone made an app that uses iBeacon technology? Nice. So, I'm making one as well, version 2. Version 1 was at the beginning of this year. I decided, well, they're all rocking up with these iPads. Why don't we have iBeacons around the school and they can go around and unlock and find all the different rooms. Our school is quite spread out, so it's not all in like one building or anything. There's multiple buildings around the place. And it's a little bit daunting sometimes when you're, you know, 12 or 13 and you're like, oh, where is everything? So that's why this app is really good. They can just have a really good use of their app, of their iPad on day one and they can use this app and travel around the school and collect some gold stars. We had a lot of incoming year eights and so this was the iBeacon scavenger hunt. The app worked that I published in the beginning of the year, but it needs to look much slicker. And this year I've spent a little bit of time working on version two and that's part of the reason I'm here to learn more Swift and to get good. This is my prototype, this is what it looks like. And as you can see on the left hand side, it says, hi Jenny. Jenny is one of our leaders and that was who the prototype was aimed at. It automatically pulls their name and it's also gonna pull out their house color automatically. So when they log into the Wi-Fi network, their IP address and their username are stored and then we can just pull that. So it's seamless, they don't have to log in or anything. And it'll work really well. Also on the left, you got the, the scrolly, and I just made it using Sprite Kit. You can scroll up and down. I was going to put I was gonna put another type of scroll in there, but uh, from looking around it seemed a little bit too much to, to uh, join UI kit and Sprite Kit together. Yeah, so you've got your rooms on the left. The one that you're actively in is highlighted and it's got a little map icon. The ones that you've answered the questions to, they come up as the green ticks. And then if you find a hidden location, you get the star and then the star will animate itself and it will sit down the bottom left where it says bonus locations. And then, yeah, so you can pick up up to five stars and I'll probably have around 10 hidden locations around the school as well. So that's what I use Pythonista for. It took me about 10 minutes to create the mock-up of how the star would animate because everything else is static. It's just, uh, I could show the Photoshop file. But I wanted to show how the animation would work. So I quickly made a couple of nodes and added the actions to them. And I did a, a callback and then that's it. Within 10 minutes, I had something to show. I'm currently writing the app using Swift, and but yeah, the Python Eastern mock-up is to show the leaders what it's going to look like, because it needs to look good. So the two reasons I want to write it in Swift rather than Python Easter. Number one, you can use the Objective-C util module to bridge Objective-C and use some of that functionality. And because I need to use call location, that's what I used last time. And the other reason for me writing it in Swift rather than Python is I want to get good at Swift as well. Just a little bit of exposure and get good at both. Quickly, I'll talk about the built-in modules. And I haven't had to play around with all of them because I teach and I've got a lot of work to do. 
But I've had a go at the main ones. The UI module is awesome. If you've used UIKit, you would be able to download the Python East app and write in a couple of lines of code and it would be very familiar to you. Some of my students have had a play around with UI, the UI module before, and they've made little utility apps, little calculators, and bits and pieces. And it works really well. The scene module is the one that I spend most of my time on, and they, the students really like this because this immediately enables them to add their own textures to the nodes, and they can immediately start making it their own. Yeah, so, so the scene module allows you to create 2D games and some animations, and it uses SpriteKit underneath. At the very beginning, they pretty much just start off doing frame by frame style animation. They do all of their animating, sort of frame by frame in update method, and then as they progress further, they would learn about actions and how to create an action object the various different ways, and then they would learn how to, how to run the action to the node, and it works really well. You'll see some of the apps really soon, but if you know how to use an SK action and an SK node, that's pretty much what they've done. This is really awesome. I haven't had too much time to play around with this, but it is really good. The Objective-C Util module that comes with Python Easter allows you to bridge Objective-C classes, and that means you can do things like scene kit, and you can do some cool 3D stuff, which I'll show you in a minute. These are the other modules that you can use, just some of them that I picked out. The sound module, they really enjoy just playing sounds. It's super easy. It's got a whole bunch of built-ins, and or, or they can use their own files. But Python Ether comes with a whole bunch of built-in assets, images, sounds, and all sorts of things. One of my students has used Beautiful Soup, and he's done some HTML stuff. One of my students had had a little gut bottle, and even though it's not a Python Easter thing, they've just included it. The QR code generator is really cool, because it just does it purely in Python. It doesn't need to go out to the web and fetch anything. And the speech module, the speech module is something I usually show them towards the end of the lesson, because they like to, to use the speech module, as you can imagine. I usually show them that to them at the end. This news clip aired in November, and yeah, you probably wouldn't have seen it unless you watch ABC3. <laughs> uh, it's primarily aimed at uh, children and young people. Uh, at the time this aired, there were only two apps on the store. There was Boxscape and Third Law. And so this little clip sort of gives you an overview of what they've made. They've learned to make gaming apps, and some have made it to the app store. Here's Emma. For some of us, it's a bit of fun, or a way to pass the time. But for these kids, gaming apps are serious business. They've spent months coding their own video games, and some of them have even been listed on the app store. You play as a little TV block dude with eyes, and you go around the screen and have fun. Jasper's app is called Boxscape, while Brandon's game is called Third Law. You play as a circle where you um, shoot bullets, but when you shoot a bullet in one direction, you travel in the opposite direction. So you have to maintain your momentum and where you're shooting in order to win. They've learned how to do all this as part of a coding class at their school. We use a program called Python Easter, which lets us program in the Python programming language. Depending on how big your program is, you can write something in a minute and have it you know, really useful, or you can spend, um, the app I got on the App Store, for example, spent, took me maybe a month and a half to create. It's something many experts have been trying to encourage more kids to get into. 
They say coding will be part of heaps of jobs in the future, and these guys say it can also be a lot of fun. I think it's interesting to know like how games work and how to create some yeah, like own. I really enjoy programming and coming up with creative solutions to different problems. They say it proves that playing games during class might not be such a bad thing after all. There you go. So my, my belief is it's useful for these students to know the basics of how this stuff works and how to break down the problems and solve them bit by bit. And not necessarily that all of my students will become app developers, although this has certainly got them keen. So at the moment we have five apps that are published by students. So Aberfoyle Park High School has an app developer account and I'm the one that's doing all of the publishing of the apps. And according to Apple Education Australia, we're the first school in the whole of Australia to be publishing schools, publishing apps as a school. And that's really awesome. The, some of these students are going to develop their second. Some of them are working on their third. It's really good. So I'll quickly go through the five apps. Feel free to go and download them and get them some hits. The first one is Boxscape, and Jasper made Boxscape. He's, he was one of my year eight students last year, so this year he's a year nine. Every single thing about this is using the primitive drawing methods, so create rectangle. He hasn't used any nodes or any actions in this at all. Everything's just calculated off of uh, an X and a Y point. And it's a really good game. You can unlock the costumes. I even got a say into some of it. So the bottom left character is actually my dog, Turbo. And the, the, one, the bottom one next to my dog is actually me, because I wear my classic black and blue and green shirt. Just not today. I'm wearing my super fancy one today. Uh, top, in the top row, you've got my girlfriend wearing the, the red shirt because uh, he needed to come up with some characters and he drew, them, he drew them all himself. He just did them on the bus or whatever. I thought it was pretty cool. So go and check it out. The second one is called Third Law and it's rated five stars. It's really awesome. He had to go to his physics teacher and ask for some equations to put into it because it's, it's got its own physics engine inside. Uh, it, this one's a little bit more complex in the way it's coded. He used subclasses of Node to create the little turret shooters and then he created further subclasses for all the different types. So the spinny ones or the, the ones that just shoot one way or the ones that shoot in two directions. So that one's definitely worth checking out. This was one was from one of my year 10 Ignite students, third year Ignite students. This one was very similar in you have to move up and down the screen and dodge the squares that come at you. This one was made by one of my students in IT in year 10. Fan run, similar thing. So fan run and square blockade, they were created by people that didn't necessarily rock up at the lunch times, but they were in my class and they managed to ask me questions and uh, email contact to get help. And they, they sort of helped each other as well. Fan run, you just run away and you have to just jump over the, the empty spots and you have to stay on the land, otherwise the fan will come and get you. Our fifth and final so far is called Blockade Runner. This one has its own sort of physics engine in it as well. You move left and right and up and down and you just have to dodge the bullets coming at you. That one's really good as well. This one was only released last week so it doesn't have any ratings or anything yet. So now I want to show you some of the sort of advanced things you can do with it. This is from Brandon. And 
we're going to start off with a gravity simulation. So you can see how much code there is there. There's not, there's not a real lot, but he actually got this working and it does quite a lot for such a small amount of code. So this is a gravity simulator. Uh, the more you, the longer it runs, it'll just uh, spin around and around. That's pretty cool. The good thing about using Python is it's interpreted. So he can just quickly go and make a change. He's just changing the, the speed to speed it up a little bit. And then he can run it again. This one was pretty cool. So you can make up things really, really quickly. Obviously, Brandon's built up a bit of skill to be able to do that. But yeah, if you want to quickly, quickly prototype something, yeah, just do it. Get it. It's well, it's well worth the fifteen dollars. This was from Jasper, who's currently in Year Nine. He's just learnt about coordinate geometry and how to calculate slope and gradient. So he's made this raindrop catcher thing, which is pretty cool. So again, there's not a real lot of code, but it actually does do a really cool thing. So he ba he's basically drawing a line with his finger and then it's catching the drops. Some of the drops are going straight through and that's because uh, he's using a uh, double equals rather than a, any other sort of comparison and he, he's aware of that problem and he's currently fixing it. Um, I just really like how he, he learned this in math class last Friday and he's already doing it in the app. It's awesome. This is a little bit of how fan run works. So this app is the one where you just have to jump. You just keep tapping the screen to jump and yeah, you have to avoid the fan. And I did like how he added the parallax effect with the clouds. I thought it was clever. So this game has only been released for about a month. But yeah, I recommend you go and grab it and see what you know, young people are capable of making. This is Square Blockade, a bit of the code for that. Some of this code he could uh, further condense or refine or, yeah, condense and refine. But at the time, this was what he made and it worked. Uh, more recently, I've been helping him uh, put more things inside of loops and making the code a little more efficient. This one has a complete menu as well, as well as a, a leaderboard for the high scores. This one's also on the App Store, so go and grab it. This one here is called Combo Crusher, and it's not out yet, it will be shortly. This is also by Lockie, so this will be his second game on the store. Basically, you have to swipe and get the same colour. The colour that you are aiming for is up in the top right, and currently it's purple. You just have to keep swiping and collecting purples. Uh, um, a label node is created at the centre point of your, your final block that you have swiped, and then that score then is animated up to the top left and it joins and add, adds on to your total score. I thought it was really cool. He's done animations, he's done actions, <coughs> he's put some actions on the, when you tap the blocks, so they sort of get a little bit bigger and fade out. 
So how do the students get their apps on the store? You're looking right at me. They, they create all their, all their code for the apps 100% on the iPads. They pretty much don't have to use anything else unless they want to. For graphics, I prefer to use a computer rather than an iPad. I just find it a little bit fiddly to draw, but some of my students do use InkPad and other apps to draw, which is cool. Other people use, prefer to use like the GIMP, and they'll just use that to modify their graphics and create their own assets. Everything that they use is created themselves, so I make sure they haven't, they're not breaking copyright or anything. This is the Xcode template that the creator of Python Ether has released. It took me a little while to figure out all the different settings, but I got there in the end. This document really explains all the steps for packaging it up ready. Basically, any images that they use, they send to me. Any, all of their code, they, they send to me as well, and I drag it into the script folder, add the icons, and if you publish an app, then yeah, it's just the same thing. And then we wait. The main thing that the students learn is obviously problem solving, and lots of it. They learn lots of coordinate geometry and how to figure stuff out, how to put different things at different positions on the screen. They all learn how to create and use objects. They all learn how to subclass, and they all learn how to code asynchronously and use callback methods because you need to. They learn a lot about event handling. So from the get-go, I get them to do to put some code in touch began, touch moved, and touch ended, and they're able to respond to touch events. Sometimes they need to do things in more of a frame-by-frame -frame sort of way. So they use the dictionary, and they use the touch dictionary and look up the different touches and loop through them, and they can, they can see up to 11 touches. The first thing I'd probably show them is the control flow. We do a lot of text-based stuff, a lot of little activities that I get online or I make them up myself, and they, they do these text-based things to really get the basics and then they sort of, I teach them how to read the documentation, make sure they understand um, what the square brackets mean in the documentation, make sure they understand that if they don't know something, stack overflow, or me, and make sure they can actually understand the documentation that they're reading. It's pretty simple. And they do some frame by frame stuff in the update method, usually moving something five points up the screen or down the screen. Other than that, uh, I get them to do some stuff with lists and dictionaries straight away. So if they create some objects and they want to loop through them, I say, right, we'll just add it to a list. And then towards the, the end, they'll do some creating some nodes and actions and adding their actions to the nodes. And that's sort of where most of them are at at the moment. So what next? The main thing that they learn is problem solving. They figure out, yeah, the main thing they learn is problem solving and I want them to learn it. What next? The public iTunes U course that I use, at the moment it's private, I want to make it public so everyone can use it. It just needs a little bit more polishing. I want to release the APHS Explorer app which is the one I showed you before with the iBeacons, and I want to open source it so that anyone can just go and grab it and make it better, and then release it. What next? Also, I want to edit and publish the student interviews. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did some interviews, I filmed them all, and they had a series of questions, and it was really awesome because we need to be able to capture their story because a lot of people were asking me, oh, what have they done and all that? Like, if it's, if it's in an iTunes U course, I can say, here, have a look. And you can all go and have a look for yourself and hear their story, because they have good stories to tell. I want to run Swift Playgrounds for iPad. 
when it's released. By run, I mean I want to run it, out, run it in my class and get everyone using it. Uh, part of the story I didn't tell you is I got selected as one of two people in Australia to win a WWDC 16 Educator Scholarship. Uh, there were around 40 or so teachers that attended this year. Uh, there was one guy from Perth, plus me from Adelaide. And we met with the curriculum writers to really start pushing out Swift in schools. When I started Python Easter like three years ago, there was no Swift playgrounds, so we, might, we may end up moving to that because it's just the same thing. You get to build stuff and run it straight away. Awesome. And the other thing I want to do is I want to run some Swift Playgrounds training for teachers at my school and I'm running one in term four. When it comes out, I'm going to be running it at a couple of primary schools. I'll just go back a little bit to this. There was something I wanted to show you in here. This is probably the first, this is what started Third Law. So as you can see, he's put his own physics engine in. I do know there is a way to do it, but the scene module that's been written for Python so it doesn't include any of the uh, physics adding stuff. So he's had to put it in himself. This game I thought was pretty cool. You hold your iPad one person at each end and you play cards and the idea is you're supposed to put like a piece of paper or something in the middle to divide so you can't see each other's screen. And I thought it was cool how he, this was his first sort of go at actions and nodes and adding the actions to the nodes. I thought it was pretty clever. So that was what he called his two player game. Yeah, thank you to Vicky. I'm not actually doing the demo live, so it's working. Good tip. This was just another example of how he can go in and just tweak something. If he's going to show me something that doesn't work, he can go in and just tweak it and bang, off it goes. You can see how easy it is to create a node. It's just capital N for node and then you create it and then you add it to the, you do add child and you add it to your screen. This was his gravity simulator again. It worked pretty well. There's not a real lot of code in there but he did actually get really good at using multi-dimensional arrays and I'm not sure what I've heard that you don't really learn about multi-dimensional arrays until university level, and I think it's pretty cool that he's using them to create all sorts of things. Further on you'll see he's done, he's actually submitted one of his maths assignments for year 11 in, in Python Easter. Makes a graph in a minute. Here it is. So he actually submitted this for one of his SACE maths assignments, and I just thought it was really clever. There you go. Yeah, so you can easily create stuff. There doesn't look to be a real lot of code there. This is something that he actually, I can't take any credit for. He figured it all out on himself, by himself. This one right here. I think this is the one he submitted for his maths. I'll just go forward a tiny little bit. Yeah, so this is it. So this is how, this is what third law looks like. 
if all you people haven't cracked out your iPads and downloaded it yet. So as Brandon explained in the other video, you shoot bullets and you travel in the opposite direction. It was going to be called zero gravity or zero G, but third law is just an awesome name. All the levels are represented using 2D arrays or 2D lists, and he's using different symbols to represent the different shooters. So he's using like hashes for the walls, I think, and he's using dollar signs and other symbols to represent where on the screen the shooters are. So that enabled him to pretty quickly make his 100 levels. And he's just importing that as a separate module with all of his two-dimensional arrays. I thought it was a pretty clever way to store the levels as well. Just make my way back to the other end. I seem to have lost it. Thank you, Therese. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening to my story. <laughs>